usually when I start this clinic, there's a room full of people. And I, I guess, uh, you know, I could do this as a poll, but we don't need to because we're going to go quick. Um, if I asked you if you used the word talent in the last year uh, to describe somebody else, you'd put your hand up if you believed in that word. And, and then we would say, well, in the last year when you used the word talent, did you use it maybe sort of in a jealous way? Uh, sort of in the, one of those like, uh, well, I would like to do something as, as so-and-so, but I can't because I don't have as much talent as they do. Um, and, it, and, and if that's the way you use the word talent, um, I've, there's, there's a place on the internet that you can look up things about um, Santa Claus um, and the Easter Bunny because it's the same. Um, it doesn't really exist from a neurological standpoint. Talent is a myth. Um, there are some pursuits uh, in the world um, that require certain types of uh, genetic, maybe put it genetic anomalies, like you have to be pretty much be a certain height to be great in the NBA. You have to, you have to, you have to have a certain body type and, and start at a certain age to, to, to be great um, as a gymnast. Um, there, are, there are lots of pursuits like that. Uh, to play the tuba, for example, there's, there's only one thing, you know, which is enough distance from the bottom of your nose to the tip of your lip so that you could fit that mouthpiece in there when, when you would want to play. If that doesn't fit in there, then playing the tuba is going to be difficult prospect for you. But in most instances, it's not some sort of predisposition from a genetic standpoint that has to be in place for us to be able to be good at something. When we're looking at skill, uh, and I was like, wait a minute, when we're talking about certain things, it's, we're just talking about a lack of practice. So what we're looking at when we think somebody looks talented, when it looks beautiful, when it looks easy, or doing something, um, uh, what we're really looking at is skill that's highly acquired. So when we're trying to figure out how to acquire skill, we know where, what state of mind that we have to be when it's time to acquire skill. So if that case, sorry, hold on. Oh dear, freezing, breaking and freezing. I'm gonna let my, if reconnect, okay. Not reboot. Reboot or reconnect. Everything cool? Everybody happy? Good. Okay, sorry. Thanks. So, so if we're going to get to a place where we're going to acquire skill, we have to have ourselves practice. All right, so we have to take a look at then our, what I, a variable rubric for you, your humanity, you can see there on the screen. So we have a physical self, we have an intellectual self, and we have an emotional self. The one that has to be in play when we're going to learn a skill, any skill, whether it's the free throw and the B flat scale, major scale, um, uh, or, or getting better at physics, our intellect has to be in place for us to be able to practice, to be able to get better to be able to make the right types of decisions so that advancement can happen, no matter what the skill you're trying to acquire. The problem is, is that when one of these moves out of balance, the others follow. So, for example, if I'm physically out of balance, if I'm freezing cold, I'm, very, I'm not usually in a great mood. Or if it's really humid and sweaty, I'm not in a great mood. If I have, if I have a temperature of 103, right, and I've got some sort of virus, then I'm not going to be in a great mood, although maybe that will make you as such. All right. So when one moves out of balance, the others follow. Let's stop being emotionally out of balance. When we're having a, a horrible emotional argument, we usually don't display it. And maybe even after that, we do something uh, uh, absurd physically, like stub our toe, run into a wall. Um, so those, when one moves out of balance, the others follow. On the other side, when one moves towards balance, the others, that's the good news. The bad news about the good news is that there's only one access point. All right, so here's the deal. The emotional side is a, is a spectrum in the middle, like that are neutral, like joy, like enthusiasm, like mindfulness, neutrality, keeps our intellect open. As soon as we move towards things like boredom or uh, anger or frustration or sadness or depression, uh, fear, um, our intellect, is off. Our intellect is a switch and our emotional side is a spectrum. So as soon as our emotional side steps out of balance, our intellect switches off. When our intellect switches off, which is the compartment that's about uh, self-awareness, 
um, we no longer have the ability to be able to make the right kinds of judgments because our intellect is no longer in place. So when one goes out of balance, the others follow. So if the intellect is closed, your self-awareness is not there, and you're emotionally out of balance, means you're physically out of balance, the point isn't going to be emotional. Those of you that know, find yourself emotional and somebody tells you to calm down, that's not usually the reaction that we have, the opposite one. So really the only access point for getting ourselves back to a place where our intellect will switch on so that skill can be acquired is the physical one. So for me, in the pedagogy that I use in a music room, what breathing gym exercises are really for. Oboe players don't move their air like a tuba player needs to. Percussion players don't move their air like a tuba player needs to. And neither does the violinist. But everybody has a point that's physical that will help them open their intellect so that we can have a better rehearsal so that you can have a better practice session. Okay? In the process, back of that we want to get to this place where we want to, everybody to be more talented we really know is it's skill to be able to fire the skill the intellect has to be open the intellect is a switch so we have to the place where we can make that switch go to on the only one is physical so what breathing exercises are for that's what going for a walk is for um that's what uh uh, uh when you're the are in your house that's what going to get a hug is for. Um, anything that, that acts as a place that takes us out of attention one, tense place, um, is going to help us switch that intellect back on, which we need. So in the context of band, in the context of a wind instrument, why would you practice breathing? Well, because tension is the enemy of home. If I have tension in my body when I'm playing, it shows up in my sound. I can play with an open sound or a tense one. Right? So... Tension is the enemy of tone. So you can see from a lung capacity stand down below why we would need to practice breathing. Only 10 to 25% of our lung capacities are in uh, normal breathing, right? Breathing that you're doing right now when you're listening, breathing you're doing when you're talking, breathing that you're doing when you're eating pizza, breathing that you're when you're ordering takeout. Uh, every normal day breathing is just a small amount of your air, right? You know that's true. You don't have to come down. You know, come downstairs in the morning now, right? And mom's home, dad's home, they're making breakfast. And they're like, hey, honey, what do you want? You don't have to say like, excuse me for a second, hold on. <laughs> Fruit Loops, right? You don't have to do that to be able to happen. So it's a small amount of air. When you're panting, first day of band, <sighs> some sort of athletic pursuit, like walking the dog for the first time. Um, when we're, we're only using 40% of our lung capacity, and in the range of 25 to, to about 65 percent of our lung capacity when we sleep we heal tissue and we're healing tissue we're using oxygen as the transport system so breathing way more than we do when we're so that green dotted line area that you're seeing there that's the relaxed flow area this area of breathing what we do when we sleep why do we care about that for playing a wind instrument we care about that plan for royal instrument because it's relaxed and tension is the enemy of tone. So that's where I want to be able to be for this practice for playing band. But from the context of getting to the idea of how am I going to acquire skill for whatever I'm trying to acquire skill for, this is it right here, right? Tension is the enemy. So it doesn't just have to be something that's hitting you from a physical standpoint or an emotional standpoint or an intellectual one. It can be any one of those that draws the whole thing off basis. So that's where we want to be. All right, now let's remind ourselves why we do this, in other words. So this is for the teachers and the students, because students, by the way, when you're practicing, you're the teacher and the student at the same time. So in the context of acquiring skill, we're all teachers, always. Whether it is that we're a student primarily or a teacher primarily, everybody becomes both when it's time to practice, when it's time to acquire skill. So, in the context of music, here it is, right there on the board. I don't need to read it, you see it right there. So the second two are really important when you're practicing or when you're teaching in a room. You have to make it fun to attempt. In other words, the atmosphere in the room has to be that people want to try, right? And then when they do try, failure is a part of the learning mechanism, which we're going to talk about here in a second. So it has to be okay to be to, to, to screw up. So it has to be fun to make it to, to people to jump in, and then it has to be safe to fail. And when that kind of environment is there, oh man, learning can happen so much faster. All right, the rest of it is self-explanatory. So don't forget all that stuff. 
So let's move on. All right, let's talk about skills acquired in terms of what's happening in the brain. So this is a cross section of a brain, a very small portion of your brain. Those little white dots are neurons, cross section of a wire. When you do an action, when something happens in your brain, there's a little substance in your brain called myelin that wraps around a neuron. What is it's it's basically electroconductive. In other words, it it when you wrap enough myelin around a neuron, it makes the signal want to go to that neuron, which is, let's say, concert F rather than concert F sharp or concert B flat or concert D, something that's related, but the same fingering if you're a brass player. And it makes it want to go down the concert F myelin. That's a, sorry, the concert F neuron. As time goes on and you play enough concert Fs in a row, pretty soon you've got more myelin wrapped. No, not it go down the concert F but it also makes the signal faster. So this is this feeling that on day one, things are difficult, and as time moves on, uh, things become easier. That's what myelination is doing for us in terms of that. All right. So pretty soon, boom, it turns out the Texas State note, right? So that's what happens right away. So and, and when we practice what's going on. So at this point, we have to talk about, like, well, what else is together? So there's not just one that's firing when we're executing a concert F, for example. There are all types of neurons that are firing. Now, the little line going between myelinated neurons, that's not myelin. That's just a graphic represent for the neuroscientists in the room. Um, that's just the representation that those neurons are going to fire at the same time. They're now connected in their action, um, in, in their signal, in their firing. So what that means, actually, we talk about, like, well, how do we, we, we produce a right note on an instrument? We need to have a breakdown, which, of course, is one of the ways that we acquire skill in anything is that we have to understand what the ultimate goal is and then how to break down to get towards that, that goal. So from the standpoint of making the right note come out, say it was ba ba ba. my lips respond with the right pitches because of only two things. Obviously, the thing that's making my lips is air. I have to move air through my lips make the notes happen. But if my, the other part of this equation, which is what I'm here, right? Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> Harpo, 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 who is that? <laughs> yeah, okay, great, ha, ha, very funny. Go back to your, yeah, great, thanks. Late, it wasn't an F, by the way. Anyway, so, uh, uh, these are the only two things you need to be able to make the thing come out on a brass instrument. You have to hear it and you have the right ear. So in terms of every other instrument, you can boil it down to how does it sound, the imagination, and then what is the technique to make that imagination come out of your instrument? Okay. So put that back up on our rubric of, of our brain, right? And we can see that when we practice our air, so if I'm going to do, let's say it is our spangled banner, ba ba ba. And when I do it in wind, I'm actually practicing the song in my head. I'm practicing the ear, ba, 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 that I'm practicing the wind. In other words, those are connected because I've practiced them separately. And then they're connected to the result of the Star Spangled Banner. So when those two things come together, then the right notes come out of the instrument. So I'm practicing what that key would be, whatever thing that I would, whatever tune I'm trying to make come out of my here, I have to practice those things separately, which is exactly the way I practice. So, for example, so, so I would do it in ear. That's my ear version. Now my practice of the air. That's my air practice of the verse of someone to watch over me. And now here, the, here are the two together. And the notes come out the right way. So there's not any sort of concern or worry about, is this going to happen the right way? It's all I'm is my the sound that I want to make happen. Usually the sound of me singing in my head and matching that with the air that I practiced and everything comes together, the right notes come out. Now, we used to think that that was it because we didn't think that state of mind or what we were thinking about when we were practicing had anything to do with the practice, with the technique. 
we used to think that that the that the, any sort of chastisement or abusive voice in our head was something that we needed because Hollywood told us that that's what we needed to do, try harder to be able to make things happen, and that when we failed, we just didn't, simply just didn't try hard enough. Um, and from the standpoint of neuroscience and acquiring skill, nothing could be further from the truth. What we now know is, is that state of mind is extremely important because it affects your humanity. And your human has three parts. It has a physical, intellectual, and an emotional one. And so if the emotional side of you is practicing self-hate, is practicing treating you terribly when you're practicing, whatever it is you're practicing, why would the student in you at the same time open up and want to be, a, you know, be in an environment of learning because not an environment of learning? The thing that we'll do carefully, the thing that we'll do separates, the thing that we'll seek out guidance for are the things that we love to do. That's the truth. You can't be great at whatever you want to be great at. What you can possibly be great at is the thing you really love to do. If you follow steps like a guide, a coach, a teacher, understanding how to break things apart, and then learning to use the word let instead of the word try when it's time to press. Probably the most important lesson today. So what else could possibly be happening in our brains then when we're practicing, right? Okay, so a lot of times we're going to the practice room because somebody told us to. It's like you've got to practice 45 a day and then you got to give it an hour a day and then it's got to be 90 minutes a day and then three hours a day and then five hours a day and then eventually, bam, Juilliard happens. So duty takes us into the practice room. Now, if I was somewhere other than my kitchen, I would tell you the sound that usually accompanies duty in my household, but that's the flushing toilet because that's what we do with duty here at the Sheridan K household here. That's what we do. We flush duty because duty does not belong when it's time to be skillful when it's time to practice no why because it's tense fear doesn't belong in the practice room and a lot of times everybody well right now everybody to some element in their life right but the other part of this was the other part of this is is that practice rooms especially in the music room a lot of our students are showing up in the band room orchestra room scared to give the right answer because every other class is about the right answer and the music ensemble room, the music classroom is the classroom about expression. That's what's there. And expression is boundless. So we got to meet them at the door. We got to let them know that, hey, welcome to the room of expression. When you're meeting yourself at the door of the practice room, say, hey, welcome into the room of expression. Letter A, X, letter B, this, letter C, this, D, all of the above, E, blah, blah, blah. No, that does not belong in a practice room. What belongs in the practice room is joy and care and trust and love. That's what belongs there. What else shows up in the practice room frequently? Anger shows up. Why? Because we screwed it up because we failed, right? How many of you have been practicing? And when you're practicing, the voice in your head finally says something that if you said that out loud to your grandmother, she would slap you, right? We treat ourselves so terribly when we practice. And if we're a teacher, when we're listening back to our bands or our ensembles, or somebody's giving us such critique, we go home and we just beat ourselves up about it. So horrifically, we don't treat ourselves like we would if it was our own child or if, it, or if we were the teacher with the student when they were getting the bad news or they had failed and what we would do for, for them. So that's where we have to be, when we're, whether we're either teaching it or we're practicing it, we have to be a great teacher to ourselves. Judgment, of course, always shows up in the practice room. You're like, well, how am I supposed to get any better if I don't have any judgment? Well, we'll talk about that. All right. And of course, the neurons that fire together wire together. So now all of these things are happening when you show up in the practice room. It's like, okay, well, I have to go to the practice room because I've practiced fear and judgment in the practice room. Now all everybody's there. And so now they're all wired together. And now, boom, I have performance anxiety. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the brain of somebody with performance anxiety. When people have anxiety, this is not a lack of thought. It's not that they're not thinking fast enough. It's, there's so much going on in their brain. It's completely overwhelming. It's not simple. And if you think about your favorite performers, even your favorite teachers, when they're doing what they do at their best, it looks effortless. It looks beautiful. It doesn't look angry, judgmental, fearful. And it does never looks like duty. It looks like an offering every single time. So where we're going to be to a place where we're not going to have so much tension in the room, this one. And you're like, okay, well, great. We're going to talk about joy in the middle of the first global issue to affect everybody, except for the one we've ignored, global climate, um, uh, ever. So how to be joyful in the middle of this? I'm not sure I have the answer for that, 
but I do have the answer for how you're going to get better at skill, which is you're going to have to learn how to find joy. So we're going to have to like, okay, well, that means that I not only have to know how to practice in the practice room, which is I got to be able to hear it. So I have to sing it when I'm playing it. And I have to know if I'm a wind instrumentalist, I have to do the technique of that. So that would be the wind, right? Uh, and then I have to put it together. I have to practice, but then I also have to try to practice joy in the practice room. And I'm so judgmental and angry and fearful in the practice room. So we're going to talk about how you're going to get that to happen in the practice room. But the first step is you got to remind yourself that this is your humanity, right? When one is out of balance, they all move out of balance. They're all there. Guess where we all are right now? Exactly. On that red arrow right now, every day for many, many weeks, for many of us watching from around the world. And if what is going on in the world has not yet you personally it will eventually but for me it only took from the middle of january before some of my friends knew somebody that had passed away in china it was uh saint patrick's day before somebody that had passed away from this and now the list is over 10 people so for me just from the standpoint of it of, of of my personal life this whole is really on the red line right now so when it's time for me to practice my tuba, practice my euphonium. I have to make sure that before I go into the room, I get myself to move back towards the middle with some sort of physical exercise, some sort of breathing, some sort of mindfulness routine. Because I don't want to with fear, anger, judgment to my practice of playing whatever it is, whether it's an studying a student or teaching a student in all those regards. Okay, so we need a list. We need a we need a mirror. So this is a mirror of how to be an awesome teacher, which by the way is how you become an awesome student because the very best students are great teachers for themselves when they're in the room by themselves practicing. Michael Jordan was the greatest teacher of himself shooting free throws by himself practicing by himself for years and the greatest student at the same time. So if you look at this list and you don't see yourself as a teacher or as a student on this list, then that's the first thing you have to work on. But at this, so before you teach, before you play, you have to get on this list. Access point, physical, that's the only one. You can't go any other way. You're gonna ask a three-year-old to calm down. You're gonna ask somebody who fell down the escalator and broke her hip to calm down. No, that's ridiculous request. You have to do something proactive to move yourself to a place so that your intellect is open and your emotions are at least calm. Will it happen for hours at a time? No, it won't. It won't happen for hours at a time under the best of circumstances, and we're nowhere close to that right now. So take a look at this list before I move on to the other one. This list for me started with a wonderful teacher. She used to teach trombone at the University of North Texas. Her name's Dr. Jan Kagerice. She's one of the foremost experts on the planet for helping instrumentalists and, uh, and musicians, period, um, of all sorts, uh, deal with um, issues related to task-specific focal dystonia and other performance anxiety issues. And she uses a list similar to this. Mine started with this, and then what I did was thought about all the awesome teachers that I had and um, and then uh, wrote a few more in and changed the order of importance for myself so that this sort of eventually became my list. But truth be told, the generation of this started with, with Jan, who's phenomenal. And you can find her on Facebook and she's delightful and lovely. All right. So we got to have a list. In other words, OK, so let's look at that. You know, fear, judgment. Remember when you were teachers in college and somebody would go in front of the window and then you would play with something to prove, you know, right? A lot of us get involved in perfection and execution, which is not where we should be when we're practicing. A lot of stuff on the bottom seems to make sense. Like, the, uh, here, let me type her name. Jan K. Rice. There you go. Um, um, a lot of focus on the bottom um, is about... Um, things that we think are okay. Like I got a problem, so I got to focus on the problem. Um, or there's, I, I don't feel good today. My chops don't feel good. So it's like, I can't play because my, I, you know, I, this doesn't feel okay. Um, or there's something with my instrument. So I'm going to focus on mechanics of playing my instrument. These things in many contexts, like the right thing to do, but from the standpoint of tension or no tension, they create tension. They're not neutral. 
A lot of things on this list seem like they should be okay to do. They're not. You have to not do these things. And if you're like, well, I don't feel I get to a place in some of these areas, it's because your myelin has a lot for you to feel like it's the right choice. <sighs> yeah, right. Sticky situation. Here they are opposite of each other. So this is the real tool that I use in the practice room. This tool in the practice room um, for me is about uh, the opposite. So I lined them up, right? So if I find myself, so if you ever take your hand and put it over the, the A list, cover up the A list so that you can just see the B list. Now, when you're looking at the B list, you're like, oh yeah, I, got, I feel like I have something to prove. Now you can uncover the A list and look straight across and it says, well, that's where you're supposed to be is something offered, right? If you get stuck in being reactive, you're supposed to be proactive. On the instrument, you should be focusing on the ear, your, your music, right? Let's look at the second from the bottom there, trying to make it happen and letting it make it happen, all right? If the truth, if it was exciting that practice and repetition was super dramatic, then there would be a mini series hosted by Ken Burns about the free, show, the free throw shooting of Michael Jordan. And it would be, you know, a 60 part series of 700 hours of him free throws, which would represent less than one half of 1% of the amount of time he spent practicing free throws. Nobody would watch the series. Not even Ken would be able to do enough uh, uh, screen wipes and, 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 and camera moves to make that many free throws for 700 hours seem interesting. But that's the truth of human achievement. And when you watch Hollywood, when you go to a musical, when you go to any sort of anything that's going to dramatize achievement, human achievement is dramatized, especially in Hollywood and on television. When something that, that is the, the, the key thing that happens it's always done in slow motion. It's always done in a beautiful 120 frames per second with a dramatic score. And there's always stuff about, you didn't try hard enough, you didn't try hard enough. And then there's some idea that if you reach a last minute, then it will connect and then you'll be a champion. And from the standpoint of neuroscience, it could be further from the truth. Hollywood's not in the business of truth, they're in the business of drama. So if you could remember that when you're looking at two from the bottom, that it is not about trying to make it happen. It is about letting it happen. And letting it happen means you understand the process and that you get on the journey of the process. And that is the reward. The reward is the journey. The reward is not the end game. And that's how you're joyful in the process of practicing whatever skill you're trying to get better at. So this screen you're looking at now, this slide you're looking at now, that is for me, I always have the A list up and then I use it covering the B list. And when things are going great in the practice session, I look down and I can find myself on the A list in multiple places. And when things start to go bad and the rhetoric in my ear starts to get crazy uh, and um, I, I slide the music across, cover the A list, I find myself on the B list and go, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh no, oh, oh no, as they say in Minnesota. And then uh, I slide over to the A list and find myself supposed to be. You're like, okay, Pat, that's a great, that's a cool theory, you slide music back and forth, ha ha, and then your emotions change. <laughs> no, no, that's the goal, all right? That's the goal. When you can no longer be on the A list in the practice room and you can only be on the B list, you are wrapping those B list things. You're wrapping myelin. You're creating skill for the B list. So guess what? Get out of the room. Go for a get a hug, get a cookie, pet a dog, Wear a silly hat. Look in the mirror. Laugh at yourself. Okay, it's that's it's just whole notes. It's just an F sharp. It's just two and three for crying out loud, right? It's not the end. So that's the other part of this that you have to 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 put, which is you have to allow yourself to break contact with skill acquisition. It's not about banging your against the wall until it finally breaks away. It's about treating yourself like every great teacher would treat you on the outside in your brain. And when your brain no longer treats you well, you're practicing self-hate, stop practicing that, get out of the practice room and go do something else. That's the truth. Because when you've got to that point where your emotions are that out of balance, your intellect closed, you're not acquiring skill for anything that you want, only the things you don't want, and you're making your job better, harder, right? You've got five minutes of good practice and 55 minutes of duty by the time you finish the second day of practicing you have 110 minutes of duty practicing and 10 minutes of good practicing that is a hole you will never get out of ever 
better to practice five minutes great and walk away and don't practice poorly for 55 minutes and then come tomorrow and practice for five more minutes or practice five minutes and do great stuff and then come back 20 minutes later and practice five more and then five more and five more. When I was in high school on my way to go to college to study music, I was practicing in the neighborhood of three to five hours a day, six days a week. And it was never more than an hour in a row because of the same reason for you. I was busy, the day was segmented. So I grabbed 20 minutes here, 10 minutes here, five minutes here, two minutes here, 15 minutes here. If you wait for that moment where the schedule opens up and you're like, oh, it's the perfect time to practice, you'll never practice enough. And you probably won't even find those moments to practice. So do it in small increments. Probably the biggest advancement my children made and all of my students make in their study ability is when they learn to put all their subjects out at once and set a timer for no longer five, six minutes in a subject before moving on. If you wanna know what subjects I spend my time in when I'm practicing, sorry, I gotta go back to it. There it is. I spend them here. In other words, I never get to the a threshold where my brain goes to sleep because I practice in air separately, practice in singing separately, and then I put them together. So once I know the piece of music, in other words, once my ear is in place, then the only thing I'm doing is a trio of practicing and I only play on my instrument one third of the time, one third of the time, one. That's the F concert third. The other two times I'm doing it in wind and I'm doing it in There is only one way to do the ear and that's to sing it. So I sing what I see. Everything I practice, everything you've ever heard me perform in public, I sang it. I sang it at least the third amount of times I played it, all right, at least. So I sing everything before I play it. Then I wind it. I do winding three ways. There's three ways to do the wind. I don't have a slide for this, sorry. One is the wind pattern. So wind patterning would be. Wind, the second way would wind horn, where I would go through my instrument so wind horn B version prime, right? Sort of a subprime would be with the valve. Right, and then a third of the wind pattern would be a low note version. So I get a version where I'm using the most amount of air, but only on one note. So let's say low F, for example. On a low, on the bridge of the banner. So one of three ways, wind pattern, wind horn, low note version. And then I go to the putting in and then the notes come out the right way. So everything I practice, Scouts Honor, I never got into the Scouts. I got thrown out of the Cub Scouts. But somebody's Scouts Honor, I practice this way. I sing what I see, I win what I see, and then I put it together. Every piece of music. And that does a couple of things. Number one, it practices my separate. So I'm really gaining skill for my how, making sure I know how the, the song goes before I'm practicing, right? Brass players, think about all the times you practice when you're developing and you're in the middle or upper register and you're not sure you're on the right note. So you test down an octave first to see if it's the right note. I trust me, that F sharp down below the staff is the same as the one above the staff. Right, but we're you're playing by geography rather than using your ear. So practice singing, even if you play an instrument. Practice your wind, if you use wind to make vibration. And if you don't, if you're a string player, to wind pattern your music. I've never had a, a group that I've worked with, an honor orchestra, to somebody's orchestra at a school that didn't get better when we wind pattern the music from the standpoint of what it does to improve your humanity, right? That's not a theoretical model for string players too, right? So if they're doing something physically, they're opening up their intellect and they're neutralizing their emotions. So that's what breathing does for them in that context. Okay, let's go back to where I was. So this is where we were. That's our list. That's our mirror. Let's talk about what we, why we really do this, right? Before we have maybe have some questions and, 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 and get some, some examples, right? 
when we go to band, we exist to make each other. This is from my friend Josh Van Gorder, and, and it, uh, when we talk about this in a clinic that we do about beginning band, it's so true. It's the only place when you go, when you don't talk about citizenship, you don't talk about empathy, you don't talk about any of the things that make us human when you go to physics class, or you go to chemistry class, when you come to band, when you come to choir, when you come to orchestra, I, I would make this, the argument that we're not really learn, there to learn music. I would make the argument that we're really there making people better, that we're really le there learning humanity and we're using music as the vehicle to make ourselves better as humans. That's what drove most of us to come into the band room or the choir room or the orchestra room is that there was something inside of us that was not the language we spoke, but it was a language we didn't speak and we had to get it out of ourselves. And music was that vehicle. So remember that in band, in orchestra, in choir, we exist to make each other better. Keep it fun. I got all kinds of credit when I practiced in high school and college being super disciplined. I'm not disciplined. I enjoy practicing. If you are in a pursuit and you don't enjoy the practice of the pursuit and you can't get yourself where well, you do enjoy the practice of that pursuit, it's the wrong pursuit. It's okay to quit. If you've tried all the stuff, you've had a good teacher, you broke it apart and you still hate it, you're just practicing hate. Don't do it. Find something you love to do and get a guide and break it apart and take your time and let it happen. And guess what? When you fall in love with that part of the journey, you will become highly skilled at whatever it is you're whether you're teaching or you're in a classroom teaching, whether it's online or when we eventually get back face to face, you have to make sure if you want people to move forward that it's fun to take a chance and that it's okay to fail. That's on every teacher, whether it's in a classroom setting or whether you're by yourself in a practice room and you're the teacher to the student in you, you have to make it okay to make it be, to make it number one, fun, safe to, make, to give it a whack and it's okay if didn't work that's it cool that one that's all for there that's from my wife michelle kalo she's a band director at class gilbert classical academy which is a public school in gilbert uh, public schools here in arizona and i was on my way out the door to a middle school honor band her accounting I, i've done middle school honor bands before but i was like i have little nuggets from from great teachers so i said to her on the way out the door i said okay honey if you, if you pretend I'm like the first year teacher and I'm going to do my first band, which would never happen first year teachers. And if it does say no. Um, and, uh, and so you're going to impart with like one nugget, like what's the one thing I can remember when I'm working with middle school kids. And she goes, remember, it's not frustrating. It's funny. And I was like, Oh, that's so great because you know, seventh graders, eighth graders say, of a difficult time. They're just, they're, they're, their intellect is just coming on to play and their intellect is arguing with their emotional state, which does till when? That's right, five years old. Um, and uh, it was the perfect thing. I wrote it on a little post-it note and I kept it on my stand. And every time I had that like junior high teacher rage, I just looked down and smiled and, and, and laughed about it. Right, junior high teacher rage. That's right, I said it. All right, so that's, that's, it's really important when you're practicing. It's like, hey man, you gotta be, you gotta take care of yourself. Right. And if you're a parent and you when your kid gets too serious, that's one of the first things we do is go to comedy to lighten the room up. So don't forget to do that in the room. Print this page out and put it in your practice room. All right. And then if you're a teacher, don't forget to celebrate this. And if you're a student of music, don't forget to celebrate this. You are learning a piece of expression that you can do in all the countries of the world and make people have a feeling that's beautiful and that's good because you learned music. So don't stop doing that. That's my small community music Arr, for our time together. So I've been, we've been together for, mm, what has it been, 45 minutes? Yeah, so a couple resources. I didn't talk about the breathing in general. If you guys know about the breathing gym, you can Google that and find all about that. What you wanna know if, if you're a teacher or a student and you wanna know more about breathing and how it works in your body, you need to look at this book, which is The Structures and Movement of Breathing by Conable. It's sold by GIA. You can find it online a lot of places. And then she has a website which goes a wonderful resource for learning more about the the, the somatic truth um, of the nature of, of your body when you it's time to play whether it's or singing or string instrument so you're going to go to that website all right then if you want to get a hold of me after this that's the only two ways to do it that's my email that's my cell phone right there that's the number so if you you have questions about this reach out that's one of my favorite things about when we do stuff like this and now we're connected and so you can be a hold and a hold of me and uh, let me know if you've got some questions or 
some comments about some of the things or a story to share um, about the learning process. Um, would be, I would love to hear that. And then the last one, and this is going to look a little because of the squish download, and it's become well, this is an eight and a half by 11 of the A list and that out. Same with this one. This blows up band directors. This blows up real big. So it's a nice dynamic ladder. For me, it's important to give the truth of mezzo piano and mezzo forte, right? They actually exist, that they're not a smaller uh, version of piano and forte, right? Hal Leonard, Alfred, Yamaha, right, people? Okay, so all there's, and that by that levels of dynamics, it gives us P's and four F's as being professional dynamics, and three F's and three P's as being something only great college ensembles do. So if you teach high school and lower, then it gives us, you know, sort of three to an eight in the, the places where we wade in the of expression. Anyway, use it as you like. Here's another one. This is for me the monopoeic version of articulations. I wish articulations looked like this in terms of their weight so that we could see it visually on the page. Um, uh, I understand that 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 these are different and that a tenuto does not mean full value, that tenuto is pressure and it's pressure between nothing and accent. I wish we could treat that the, that way because if if no means full value or that means legato, uh, then what is what is the one with no uh, marking on it mean? Right? Doesn't mean anyway. That's the deal. Those are my rules and that relative. To so if the dynamic you saw mezzo forte, then the dynamic you would play if you had articulation would be represented as all right. And they do, uh, Mary Ellen, they blow up into huge posters, uh, no problem. The band room where I, my community band, the band director there, Brian Wilson, has taken these PDFs and printed sort of in four quadrants and then put them up on, on this board behind them. Prints. And then for the brass player room, this the dynamics, sorry, all the articulations looking the normal size now, and then what changes whether you're using it or when you're articulating. And the O is the same. You know, the size of my mouth doesn't change when I play louder or soft size, what changes the, the size of my articulation. So those charts are all available, three, those three readings here at the end, and then and this A. B list, which is an eight and a half by 11 print. We're going to put it in the make sure they're on when they're all right. So, I want to go back to there. Sorry, sorry, there. Okay, so I think sort of my four or five minutes or so. Uh, the questions about the PDFs uh, um, will answer. Those, the, our host will answer those questions about where those will be available. Um, and uh, 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 so is there anything, well, I guess we'll just do this via the, I don't know how we can do this via chat or if you do it in terms of some other thing. But if you have a question via the chat, um, let me know about what we just talked about. And we can, well, I can spend a few minutes doing that before we, uh, we go practice. Right? We're going to go practice. <laughs> Thank you guys. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Glad you guys came. Glad we had a chance to hang out. All right. Well, I don't see any questions coming up, so let me do this. I really, I'm going to record with this bit, uh, a little bit later. But uh, since you guys came, and since uh, there's DCI this summer, and even if that means you're you're joyful about. I'm going to play a song of the marching baritone, right? So this is for all of you. Thanks for hanging out.
Thanks everybody. Nice to see you for being here. Take care, be safe, be well. Go practice, have fun.